this edition for Saturday, March 2nd. President Trump addresses the Conservative Political Action Conference. Fertile ground in Libya for ISIS to regroup. Ignition, lift off. And a new era in American space life. Next on PBS NewsHour Weekend. From the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center in New York, Hari Srinivasan. Good evening and thanks for joining us. In his first public appearance since returning from Vietnam, President Donald Trump spoke today at the annual Conservative Political Action Conference in Maryland. In a wide-ranging and at times rambling speech that began with the president hugging a U.S. flag, Mr. Trump once again railed against special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation of Russian interference in the 2016 election using an expletive to describe it. They're trying to take you out with bull****, okay? With bull****. Over more than two hours, the president praised his 2016 electoral victory and said he will win in 2020 by a larger margin. He praised the country's low unemployment rate and his administration's tariff policies. He talked about the border with Mexico, veterans, abortion, so Iraq, free speech on college campuses, and North Korea. And he attacked Democrats as socialists and mocked their proposed this Green the New Deal. Democrat. We believe in the American dream. Not in the socialist nightmare. And the president ended with another reminder of what he's calling a special, quote, salute to America celebration in Washington, D.C. on the 4th of July. Joining us now from Washington, D.C. is Osita Wanebu, a reporter for The New Yorker who covers politics and policy and who's been covering the events at the Conservative Political Action Conference. What was the big theme this year? Well, big theme this year, I think, was basically socialism. Uh, that was a th through line through every major speech that you heard, not only from President Trump and Vice President Pence, but all of the sort of B-list speakers as well. There was a big intro video that they showed multiple times during the convention that featured clips of Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and other Democratic figures who they think are embracing left-wing policies uh, that are gonna be too far left for the electorate. Whether that's true obviously remains to be seen, Republicans have been doing that and, and using socialism as of a course. word to tar the left with for a long time. Now, what's the difference? That they have evidence? That they have members of the other party claiming membership? Well, they do have some candidates like Bernie Sanders, obviously, who actually started his campaign with an event in Brooklyn today who's going around calling himself a democratic socialist for a long time, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, I personally would be very skeptical that this is something that's going to seem new and fresh to the electorate who heard these kinds of claims. You know, if you want to look at the record of presidential elections, the past three, uh, they called Obama too far left in 2008, uh, didn't win. They called them the same in 2012, they didn't win. By contrast, Trump, who did spend a little bit of time calling Hillary too far left, actually focused most of his campaign on calling Clinton corrupt uh, and a member of sort of the political elite, if anything, too close to the rich. Uh, today, he talked about the ruling class in his speech to CPAC. And that kind of approach uh, set him apart from other Republican candidates, and he did obviously win the election. Mm -hmm. So if I were Trump or people advising Trump, I'd be very skeptical of ditching that kind of original message. You know, the conservatives have a fair amount to celebrate. I mean, they can look at the administration's record on deregulating things. They can certainly look at the uh, successful nomination of two Supreme Court justices now that think a lot more like them than uh, the previous appointees. I think that's true, obviously, the tax cuts as well. They talked a lot about that during the conference. There are things that they can tick off. I think the real question now is, with the Democrats in control of the House, how many more victories are there going to be for the administration? So it'll be really interesting to see how Trump continues to try to stoke his base in the absence of real victories he can deliver them. Obviously, he's trying to do that with the national emergency he declared mm -hmm. uh, over the wall. We'll see if that actually pans out into anything that's going to get sections of that wall really built. Um, but he's really going to struggle to deliver um, not only campaign promises, but sort of the, the, on the mood that he tried to cultivate here at CPAC. Um, I think that one of the things that's going to be central is, again, this, this idea that there is a rising tide of socialism on the left that conservatives have to sort of band together and combat. They're going to be in a more combative mood, and maybe that sort of takes the pressure off Trump to actually deliver things. Uh, finally, I want to ask, you spent uh, several days there talking to young people, young conservatives. Uh, what's your sense? Is there uh, a newfound energy because of Trump? Do they, are they more optimistic of their own futures? Well, I think there is a lot of energy because of Trump. I think that he seems like a different kind of Republican politician to younger conservatives, campus conservatives, um, somebody who's willing to poke liberals in the eye. 
Uh, and there are a lot of young conservatives who really enjoy that. One of the most striking presences at the uh, uh, conference this year was a group called Turning Point USA, founded in 2012 that's exploded over the past couple of years. Uh, and their agenda is basically sort of ribbing liberals on campus in a way that is frankly quite similar to the kind of uh, jousting that Trump does rhetorically on the national political stage. Charlie Kirk is the group's founder. He had a big, big uh, mm -hmm. speaking slot at CPAC this year, as did Candace Owens, their communications director. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of interest in that group and, it, you know, it, it was given a lot of space and certainly a lot of people are joining. All right. Osito Wanevu, a reporter for The New Yorker. Thanks so much. Thank you. U.S.-backed forces in Syria continued operations today in the last piece of Islamic State-controlled territory. A spokesperson for the Syrian Democratic Forces said Kurdish-led fighters advanced into the area near the town of Baghuz overnight. The SDF claimed there was heavy ground fighting and that ISIS extremists used booby traps and sniper fire. There were also reports of an explosion and thick black smoke in the area thought to be from a U.S.-led coalition airstrike. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un left Hanoi, Vietnam today, two days after his summit with President Donald Trump ended abruptly. Before his departure, Kim laid a wreath at a war heroes monument and visited the mausoleum of former Vietnamese leader Ho Chi Minh. Supporters and government officials greeted the North Korean leader as he boarded his private armored train at the Vietnam-China border. His return train trip to Pyongyang will take more than 60 hours. There were more protests and new fighting today in Indian-administered Kashmir. In the city of Srinagar, supporters of the People's Democratic Party demonstrated against a government ban on the largest political and religious group. India says the ban is a crackdown on activists seeking to end their rule in the disputed region. Near the dividing line between India and Pakistani-controlled regions, officials said new fighting killed at least six civilians and two Pakistani troops today. This past week, India launched airstrikes on what it claimed were militants in Pakistan who carried out a suicide bombing that killed 40 Indian troops in Kashmir on February 14th. Pakistan shot down an Indian fighter jet but returned the pilot to India yesterday in what it said was a peace gesture. The aid group Doctors Without Borders is suspending its operations at the Ebola epicenter in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The humanitarian group blamed continuing violence and attacks on two of its treatment centers. During the latest attack on Wednesday, armed assailants set fire to a clinic before engaging police in a shootout. The current Ebola outbreak began last August. The World Health Organization reports more than 870 confirmed and probable cases of Ebola in the Congo and more than 540 deaths. Doctors Without Borders said it will continue to provide patient care in other less violent areas in Congo. Just before 3 a.m. today, a SpaceX rocket carrying a capsule known as Crew Dragon lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The capsule is designed for astronauts, but on this mission, it's carrying only a so-called smart dummy named Ripley, designed to gather data about how the flight might affect human occupants. The Crew Dragon is now in orbit and will attempt to dock with the International Space Station tomorrow, if successful. It could mean NASA will use privately built spacecraft for future missions as soon as this summer. Joining us now from New Orleans, where she's been monitoring Crew Dragon, is Lauren Grush, senior science reporter for The Verge. Why is this such a big deal? You know, since the space shuttle program ended in 2011, NASA has only really had one option for getting its astronauts to the International Space Station, and that has been the Russian Soyuz rocket. And it's not been a great uh, arrangement because it's expensive. It costs NASA $81 million per seat to get just one astronaut to the International Space Station, and it's limiting. We only have that one option, so if the Soyuz were to go out of commission, then we wouldn't have a way to get our astronauts into space. But with the Commercial Crew Program, it's about bringing the human spaceflight program back to America. These capsules are built by U.S. companies, and when they launch people, that'll be the first time since the space shuttle program that NASA astronauts have launched from American soil on American-made vehicles once again. When we saw this rocket lift off, it was kind of a throwback. I mean, these capsules look like the capsules that we saw in the early parts of the space program. They were kind of designed to do one thing versus the space shuttle, which was designed to do lots of things. When it comes to how to build a capsule, there's really a a good design for how to launch into space and then how to bring it back again. So, you know, the capsule design is kind of dictated by, you know, the best way to get to and from the International Space Station. But yes, it, it is 
quite reminiscent of the early capsules that we used to build. Is there a kind of longer term vision here if this goes well? And again, this is a big if. I mean, this is just part one. So I guess let me just talk about that a little bit. Getting it to space wasn't the hard part. There are a couple of kind of intricate maneuvers that have to happen. Usually the space station reaches out and grabs whatever's coming to it, but this is supposed to happen automatically? Right. So a big difference between this capsule and the Dragon cargo capsules that SpaceX has been sending to the International Space Station since 2010, those are berthed to the ISS, which means that, yes, a robotic arm uh, operated by a crew member grabs the capsule and then brings it onto the space station where it is then attached. But these capsules automatically dock, so they use a series of lasers and sensors to find the a docking port on the outside of the International Space Station, and then it just automatically moves toward it and then uh, attaches on its own. And that's something that SpaceX has never demonstrated before. So if they can pull off that maneuver, which is slated for tomorrow, then that's going to be a very big deal because that's going to be how they bring astronauts to the International Space Station in the future. And then finally, it's going to have to hang out there for about a week and then splash down the old-fashioned way in the middle of the ocean on Friday, right? Right. It's not going to stay for very long, just a few days, but the three crew members on board the International Space Station right now, they'll go inside the capsule, they'll bring out some cargo that it brought up with it, they'll also pack it with cargo, they're going to run some tests to see how it's faring in the space environment, you know, is it sturdy, is it doing what it's designed to do, and then on Friday morning, after all is said and done, it will undock slowly, and then it'll re-enter Earth's atmosphere, and then a series of parachutes will deploy to uh, slow the capsule's descent to the Earth, and it'll splash down in the Atlantic off the coast of Florida. That is if all goes well. <laughs> all right, Lauren Grush of The Verge joining us via Skype. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. To watch the launch of the SpaceX test mission, ignition, liftoff, visit pbs.org slash news out. This week, the head of the Libyan government and the country's opposition military leader met and agreed to hold nationwide elections in the politically torn country. A previous attempt at an election had been delayed as territorial disputes and instability across regions were allowing groups like ISIS to take advantage of the disarray. PBS NewsHour weekend special correspondent Christopher Livesay and videographer Alessandro Pavone reported on that instability back in October and the power vacuum that ISIS was trying to fill. Their reporting was supported in part with funding from the Pulitzer Center. The city of Sirte, once the crowning jewel of the Islamic State in Libya. It was part of 150 miles of ISIS-controlled coastline from 2015 to the end of 2016. Today, the city has been reduced to rubble, first in an offensive against ISIS led by Libyan security forces in 2016 then by nearly 500 precision airstrikes from the United States. Bombing largely ceased last year. Large swaths of town remain abandoned. The government has yet to clear hundreds of corpses beneath the rubble for fear of mines and unexploded ordnance. Because of that, the air is still thick with the stench of rotting bodies. Colonel Ibrahim bin Rabat is the commander of Libyan counterterrorism forces in Sirte. My son volunteered to fight ISIS and protect Sirte. ISIS killed him. He was 24 years old. The six-month offensive eventually wiped out an estimated 2,500 ISIS combatants. But bin Rabat tells us sleeper cells still lurk, especially in Sirte's desert. Though it no longer controls any territory, the spike in violence has been sharp. In 2017, ISIS managed to pull off only four attacks. So far this year, it's more than a dozen. The most audacious was in May, when ISIS gunmen stormed Libya's election commission headquarters in Tripoli, detonated suicide vests, and killed at least 16 civilians. So ISIS is in this direction. They're regrouping in the desert here in the south. At any time, they can come in, one or two people, and blow themselves up. We rely on shepherds to tell us if there are any ISIS fighters passing through their pastures. So far this year in Libya, there have already been more than twice the number of ISIS attacks. Is ISIS trying to regroup in order to launch attacks abroad, outside of Libya as well? Right now, they lack the ability to control any major territory in Libya. But they're doing their best to regroup and mount attacks again. Our men have proven themselves in this war with the Islamic State. 
But we ask and we hope for help from other countries. We cannot eradicate ISIS on our own. That's largely because ISIS isn't Libya's only problem. The country has been reeling since 2011, the year of the NATO-backed overthrow of Libyan strongman Muammar Gaddafi. By 2014, a full-blown civil war was underway. Today, the oil-rich country remains divided. A UN-backed government in the West sits in Tripoli, with jurisdictions stretching down to CERT. A rival administration rules the East, and in between, numerous well-armed militias governed only by themselves. For its part, the U.S. continues to support the government in Tripoli with airstrikes against ISIS. But that only offers short-term solutions, according to the U.N. Special Envoy to Libya, Ghassan Salame. This can produce an effect, but it's very uh, limited effect. It's an effect on like killing one particular leader or one particular chief of a band or something like that. But uh, the real solution to terrorism in Libya is to rebuild a, a strong, unified, legitimate state. There is no other alternative to that. Both governments have agreed to general elections at the end of this year, a vote that would elect a unity president in parliament. At this checkpoint in CERT, unity seems a long way off. Troop morale is low. We've gone a year without getting paid. We fought and died saving the city from ISIS. The government in Tripoli needs to respect that. And take this border crossing between Libya's rival governments in the east and west. The colonel says it's become a critical weak link for ISIS to exploit. There are more than 500 yards of no man's land between these two gates, where neither government has direct control. ISIS is using that area to take shelter, resupply, and attempt to infiltrate the city. No-go zones are common, and they aren't relegated to checkpoints. In fact, entire swaths of Libya are lawless, and government officials fear to enter. We travel to one such area in Libya's far western region in order to see how freely ISIS has been able to operate. Driving us is a minder from the government in Tripoli. It's the first time in nearly a year they've allowed American TV journalists to enter the country. In return, the government insists on constant supervision. It's not long before we're completely outside the area controlled by any government. Our government minder locks all the doors. Our destination, Sabratha. It's home to an ancient amphitheater that more recently was the backdrop of a city overrun by terror. ISIS took control in 2015 and asserted its authority by beheading 12 members of the security forces and setting up its own checkpoints. Today, the tables are turned. Libyan police, loyal to the government in Tripoli, now check for ISIS militants. One of them tells me the city is safe. But checkpoints are common targets for terrorist attacks, and any one of these vehicles could be packed with explosives. Police are also looking for stolen fuel. ISIS is known to smuggle it from Libya's vast reserves and use the profits to fund their attacks. Libya's spot on the map makes it particularly attractive to terrorists. Parts of the sprawling country, three times the size of France, are ungoverned, and the country has largely uncontrolled borders, offering several gateways for action. We head for the beach, where just a few hundred miles of open sea separate Libya from Europe. We're met by a Coast Guard commander named Jalal Dabashi. He says his top priority is cracking down on illegal migrants and the well-armed gangs who traffic them. Sabratha used to be known as the migrant capital of Libya. Traffickers smuggle the migrants from sub-Saharan Africa, across the desert to the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Traffickers would then pack migrants in this warehouse like merchandise, he says, before shipping them off to Europe in overcrowded, rickety boats. Sometimes, he adds, traffickers here worked hand-in-hand -hand with ISIS, and in nearby locations still do. They share a common interest, money. When ISIS was around, trafficking was at its peak. Traffickers paid ISIS a tax, millions of dollars per month. Sometimes they would even put terrorists on the migrant ships to Europe. I heard this directly from the biggest trafficker in Sabratha. He happens to be my cousin. Tribal bonds run deep in Sabratha, but that doesn't mean everyone gets along with those in their tribe. He sends me threatening messages. He wants to kill me. The two cousins eventually met in battle. 
Late last year, Libyan security forces attacked traffickers positioned at the ancient ruins of Sabratha, severely damaging the UNESCO heritage site. So that's from an RPG, a rocket propelled grenade. He tells me Libyan security forces eventually won, but the traffickers continue their lucrative migrant trade in neighboring towns. Fighting traffickers is just one more front in this battle for control of a brittle country. This summer, some of the most violent clashes in years erupted between rival factions, killing over 100 people in the capital Tripoli. The chaos works in ISIS's favor. The only way to fight terrorist groups on the longer term and in a systematic way is that you have a national authority doing that, controlling uh, its borders, controlling its territory and moving around to repress any terrorist activity. Do we have that now in Libya? The answer is clearly no. It's a problem that vexes Colonel Ibrahim bin Rabah, the commander of counterterrorism forces in the city of Sirt. His men eventually defeated ISIS here. But now, less than two years later, he says, militants are regrouping and waiting to strike again. We almost didn't let you journalists come today because it was too dangerous. ISIS has not disappeared. Rabah says underestimating Islamic State can have serious repercussions far beyond Libya. If the terror group is not stopped here, he says, it's just a matter of time before ISIS grows and strikes again elsewhere. The Islamic State is not only our problem. It's like a cancer spreading all around the world. Today ISIS is here, tomorrow it can spread again somewhere else. It's as simple as that. That's all for this edition of PBS NewsHour Weekend. I'm Hari Srinivasan. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.